A few months ago, I was looking to change it up a little bit. I was looking to add something to my portfolio that others in the area weren't offering. And I ended up at the Gigapan. So today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the Gigapan and walk you through some of the settings. Basically, what the Gigapan is used for is for shooting giant panoramas. It'll take as many photos as you need, hundreds of photos if you'd like, and then it'll stitch them all together to create one giant, giant image. Basically, all you have to do is set it to start in the top left corner and then where you want it to end, which is the bottom right corner of the image. And then everything in between there is what it'll take photos of. The default program is to start top left and then go down and then go to the next column and then down and the next column and down. But you can change it to do different, different grids however you'd like. The setup I use is instead of a full frame, I like to use a cropped sensor just because it can get in closer to the image, which means more photos can be taken. So I'll package that crop sensor camera with a 70 to 200 normally, and it'll almost always be on 200 millimeters. The reason for that is it will have a much more narrow field of view, which means again, many, many more images. The more images, the better, because it'll stitch them all together, and the more images there are, the more megapixels there are, the more megapixels there are, the farther in you can zoom. Now, I have tried to strap on a teleconverter onto this as well to give it even a more narrow field of view, but what I found is, unfortunately, the motors just can't handle it. Now, the Gigapan comes in three different models, uh, everything from point-and-shoot to mid-level to the Epic Pro, which handles the big DSLR. But even the big one, I found that the motors just can't handle the teleconverter. But that's okay. On the Nikon DX camera, you're looking at one and a half times crop factor. So when you pair that up with the 200 millimeter uh, lens, that's 300 millimeters. That's a pretty good distance to shoot lots of photos and then mold them all together. I'll get into how to shoot in a minute, but first I'll tell you a little bit about what's in the box. You obviously get the machine itself. What these do is they'll go straight into the body of the machine, then the other one will go into your camera so that it'll know when to take the next photo. Personally, I don't use these and I'll get to that in a minute. It comes with a charger and two batteries, which is really nice. Honestly, I've never had to use the second battery. One's always been fine for me, but it's always nice to have the second one just in case. The battery slides in nice and easy right on the side here. You twist it and take it out. Now you can charge it by either plugging the cable straight into the battery itself and then plugging it into the wall. Or what you can do is you can let the battery back into the machine, plug into the wall, and then the other end goes right here in the machine and it can charge that way. If you're shooting close to a power outlet, you can also have it plugged in, plugged into the wall, and it'll charge it as you're shooting. That way it'll never die, you can shoot as many photos as you like. But again, I've shot hundreds and hundreds of photos with these, and the batteries never died on me, so that really shouldn't be an issue. The way you attach it to a Gigapan is just like you'd attach any camera. You'll take the plate of your tripod and screw it right into the bottom of the machine. It's on now, and it's nice and sturdy and ready to go. Now up top on the arms, you have a little release plate, and then this plate goes into the body of your camera. Now, whenever I'm using my DX7100, I will only take off my battery pack just because of the way this is set up here. Unfortunately, by the time you have the body on here, this plate gets screwed in with this knob. And by the time you have the battery pack on, sometimes it can interfere with the knob. It'll work without it, depending on where your mount is on the lens itself. It'll work with the battery pack there, but it's awfully tight. So I just take it off. Um, one, so it'll fit wetter, and B, because it's lighter, obviously without it, there's less mass there, so it's lighter, and it's a lot better for the motors. So there are a handful of settings you're going to want to get right, so that at the end of the day, your Gigapan is nice, crisp, clean, and level. First and the easiest one is it comes with a bubble leveler right inside the Gigapan. So easy enough, you want to get the bubble right in the middle of the circle. Easy. Many tripods, including this one, has a bubble on it as well. Um, and what that does is it makes sure the tripod is level. That's, that doesn't really matter as much. It doesn't matter if the tripod is level. All that matters is that this is level. Like, for example, on the ball head, you can move it around to where the tripod would be completely off if you're on un unlevel ground or something. But the ball will move so that, like this, so if, say, the tripod's level, well, the Gigapane obviously isn't level at this point, so you want the Gigapane to be level. This isn't as important as this. Something else you can change is 
on this bar itself, you can raise it up and down. And it's got numbers right on the inside here to where you can compare. For example, this is just below 44. You want this side to be just below 44 as well. If not, this will be uneven. You don't want that. Something else you're going to want to keep an eye on is to make sure your lens collar is perfectly straight. If it's at a little bit of an angle and it's taking photos, then when it comes time to edit them and get them all uh, blended together, then you're going to run into some issues. So, now we know the lens collar is on right. It's all nice and tight. You screw it in just like this. You have the GigaPan itself nice and center, leveled. You have each side nice and center, leveled. There's one other measurement, and this is the most complicated one. This one is called the nodal point. It also refers to something called the parallax. And basically what it does is inside of your lens here, wherever the lines cross, similar to your eye, wherever the lines cross inside, that needs to be centered on top of the tripod. The reason for that is because if it's off by a little bit, whenever this moves side to side to get the different columns, it'll throw off the image. And it'll make it really, really hard to stitch together uh, when you're post-processing. Honestly, you probably won't even think about it whenever you're shooting the images one by one. It'll look fine, but in reality, it's not. Will they go together? Yeah, they will, but they won't be perfect. They'll be off by just a little bit. So I look. So if I were you, make sure to look into the parallax point and the nodal point and how to find it. It's really pretty easy. You can find videos online about it, and I'll probably make one in the future. So for this, the nodal point I have, I have it remembered at about 55. So as long as this right here slides, see how this slides, 105 down to 40, up to about 55, tighten that in, and you found the nodal point. After that's nice and tight, you're ready to go and you're ready to start shooting. Now the nodal point will change depending on where you're at. For example, this is a 7200 millimeter lens. If I'm on say 85 millimeters, then I'm on say 200 millimeters, that nodal point changes inside the lens. You're gonna to wanna to find it for each millimeter that you plan on shooting. You're gonna be shooting probably hundreds of photos, so you don't want there to be a big difference. Sometimes it can be 20 minutes or 30 minutes from the time you shoot your first photo to the time you shoot your last photo. So if you don't have all your settings right and on manual, then there could be a big difference between the first one and the last one. And whenever you mold them all together, it can look pretty bad. So you'll definitely wanna be shooting in manual mode that you want to set your lens at whatever millimeter you want to shoot at. For example, I'm at 200, so you leave it on 200 and you don't change it. Now you'll want to shoot at a fairly high f-stop so that everything's in focus and you have a little bit of play. Depending on where you're at and what you're shooting, that also matters. If there's something super close to you and super far away, you'll want an even bigger f-stop to try to get everything as close to focus as possible. I believe I'm around F8, F12-ish, something in that range. That's normally enough to get as much stuff in focus as possible. What I try to do is I'll look at my scene, I'll see what's about in the middle, I'll turn my camera onto it, I'll autofocus it to where that's perfectly in focus, and then flip my lens to manual so that it's stuck in and it's not moving. So now that you have your f-stop, you need to figure out your ISO and your shutter. Both of those don't matter quite as much as f-stop, so you can move those depending on your scene and how much light you have. I like to have a fairly quick shutter speed so that it freezes the action. This thing's pretty sturdy, but sometimes, depending on the wind or whatever, it can move a little bit. You don't want that to move in your, in your image, so I like to have a pretty quick shutter speed. The ISO also doesn't matter quite as much. Now the lower the ISO, the less grainy your image is going to be, so you always want it to be as low as possible. But if you have to range it to 400, 600, 800, it's not the end of the world. I like to keep it as low as possible so when you zoom in on the image, it's nice and crisp and clean. But again, if it has to go a little bit higher because you don't have as much light, you want to make sure that the shutter speed can be high enough to freeze the action. So freeze the action with the shutter speed. I wouldn't go anywhere below... 100th of a second at the absolute minimum, I would try to keep it around 200, 500, or even quicker if you can. So just change your ISO depending on that. Now if you really want to get into it, you can also lock your white balance to where that's perfect as well. But cameras nowadays are so good at getting the white balance correct in camera, I don't think that's really a necessity. Now it's time to shoot the GigaPan. So like I said before, you can use one of these wireless triggers that comes with it that connects the camera to the machine, or what I like to do is I just use my own wireless trigger. All right, so my wireless trigger's in, 
camera's on, all the settings are set up, and it's ready to go. All that's left is to get the machine programmed correctly. So you turn it on, hold down the start button, and it'll run through its startup menu. There are a couple options right away. New panorama, you can do a 360 panorama, and then there are some other options as well. You can just start off by hitting new, pro, new panorama and clicking OK. Now it asks you to set the camera zoom. Now it tells you to move the camera to the upper left part of the image. And you use that by just selecting the arrows and it will move for you. Down, goes down, up goes up. So say I want it there, hit OK. Upper left corner set, now it tells me to move it to the bottom right part of the image. So I simply move it over. Then as you're doing this, it'll keep track of how many rows and columns it takes, how many total images, and roughly how long it'll take you to shoot. So I want to go over here, and down. Say I want it to be right there. It per currently has it at 14 horizontal photos. 12 vertical photos. There's a lot to the Gigapan, so I didn't touch on everything. If there's something that I missed or you have a question, feel free to comment below or you can message me. As always, be sure to subscribe and thanks for watching.